Well, welcome everyone. This is uh, Jason Gourmet at BPC. Um, I'm told that you have the uh, beautiful BPC logo on your screen and my camera hopefully will start working shortly. But in the meantime, I wanted to welcome everyone back to uh, the second round of our uh, dynamic discussion about uh, saving the global economy. Um, many of you are recidivists having been through our admittedly slightly clunky first call. And just to kind of set the table, I think we recognize that um, until we have a somewhat more focused agenda, these conversations are going to be obviously hard to um, move in a serial fashion, but we have just a tremendous number of really talented folks who have ideas they want to share. And so we are treating this as kind of the second uh, you know, crowdsourcing brainstorming session. I think we will decide going forward if it makes sense to continue some rhythm of these discussions uh, with the more focused agenda. We got a lot of really positive feedback about the spirit of the exercise and the extent to which people are just enjoying an opportunity to, in real time, kind of share some uh, thoughts together. So I think um, we will jump into the agenda now. Um, you know, like the stimulus itself, this is something of uh, an experiment. So we will um, try to do a couple things today that are a little different. Uh, we do have about nine different speakers who are going to be uh, offering some thoughts. Again, everyone's going to try to offer you know, five, six minutes of input. Uh, we are then going to pause after each presentation and at least allow the speakers who are mic'd, kind of our virtual panel, to interact. We also um, have a chat feature that I will explain uh, after uh, Doug's presentation concludes. Um, and uh, with that, it is a uh, a pleasure to ask uh, Doug holtz eakin with the American Action Forum to uh, lead off. Doug might be talking about uh, supporting the case for airlines, but we also recognize that things are moving so quickly. A number <laughs> of our speakers are going to be workshopping new ideas as we go. But uh, Doug, floor is yours and thanks for joining. Uh, well, thank you, Jason. Thank you everyone for taking the time to do this. Um, I, I am going to stick to my assignment, which is to talk about the case for supporting the airlines. Uh, the airlines are in many cases, many ways, the poster child of this crisis. Uh, they were perfectly sound businesses that were in good shape. And then when the virus hit, uh, their customers went away and their revenue dropped precipitously and they're in uh, terrible financial shape. Um, and uh, they, they have a lot of company in that regard. Um, what makes the airlines different is they're an important part of the supply chain. And this crisis is in part a supply chain crisis we've seen uh, closures of factories, closures of whole states. Uh, we've seen people out of work because they are sick or taking care of those who've been sent home from school or are sick themselves. And so we've had a big disruption of the capacity uh, to deliver goods and services. And to exacerbate that problem by grounding the airlines would be a tragic error. Uh, passenger airlines carry about a quarter of all the cargo. Uh, the reason you have to pay so much to check your bag is they don't want your bag down there. They want to put down their Medicines, oh, this is great, my license went out. Prices is, is expanding. Um, uh, so uh, they, they don't want um, uh, your bag down there, they want the cargo down there. And that's uh, an important function that they have and, and it's important to keep them flying for that reason. Uh, as I say this, we're seeing the Congress about to vote, we think, on a measure that would include substantial uh, support for the airlines. Uh, at last report, 25 billion in grants and 25 billion in loans, I think that's exactly the right thing to do. Uh, let, let me say a couple more things. Um, a lot of people have suggested they don't need a quote bailout. Um, I don't really like that term since no one did anything wrong here. Uh, these were these were sound businesses that just simply got hit by the, the by the virus. But uh, but instead would argue they should go into bankruptcy. Uh, and normally I, I think that's the, the right way to go. Typically in bankruptcy, the planes keep flying because everybody has a joint interest in the revenues. Uh, the bankruptcy judge wants those planes in the air so that he can get revenue to satisfy the creditors to the greatest extent possible. And so you see the planes flying all the time. But the planes aren't going to fly now. No one will get on them. Uh, we have uh, you know, 50 and 60 percent cut, uh, cutbacks in their route services. We still have 20 percent capacity on many of those uh, of those flights. And as a result, they're losing money and the judge would ground the planes to preserve what little assets they have left. That would be again. The, the last thing we want to have happen here. So this doesn't look like the normal uh, bankruptcy because it's not in normal times, and that makes the case for supporting them uh, even stronger, I, I, I think. Uh, the last thing that's come up, which I view as entirely tangential, but gets raised all the time is, 
why should we give these guys uh, money when they weren't smart enough to hold on to their money and instead did stock buybacks? Uh, this sounds like to me like the, the worst of Monday morning quarterbacking. Uh, you should have known five years ago that the pandemic would hit and built up a large enough surplus to survive it. Uh, a, there was no way to know. And B, they wouldn't have built up a large enough surplus to survive it in any event. So uh, it's really a red herring from the core issue of what should we do to this industry that has an impact beyond itself to the, the larger economy? The thing we want to do that's the best for the welfare of the, the American population is to make sure it keeps flying. And that's the case for sporting airlines. Thanks, Jason. All right, Doug, thank you for leading us off. Uh, we have uh, about 50 folks online. And so I want to um, just talk technology for a second and then uh, kick a question to Doug. Um, in the upper right hand of everyone's screen, there are a bunch of logos one looks like this. It is the chat feature. I'm doing something wrong according to Andrew. It's upside down. <laughs> Welcome to the crowd. <laughs> it looks like this. Thank you. It's good to, it's good to be the king. Um, so if uh, folks click on that uh, feature, you'll have the opportunity to enter your name and then you'll also have the opportunity to type a question. We will be able to receive those questions post them, and if we're you know, really going gangbusters actually in real time, share them with our speakers. Uh, we also may collect them uh, for a bit of a conversation at the end. So it'll be so cool if that works. Let's see what happens. Doug, my question for you, and I'm going to turn it over to the other folks uh, who have live mics. There was a very, very big discussion about, you know, should there be strings attached to these resources, which I think is a conversation that's going to keep going. I think a lot of folks felt like the you know, let's impose cafe standards on the airlines was jumping the shark a bit. But um, how do you imagine the process goes forwards now, assuming the Senate actually does act? Um, you know, do you think this kind of in the same way that the auto industry uh, relationship with the government changed so much after the uh, 2010, well, I didn't quite call it a bailout, but that was more of a bailout than this. Um, you know, what was your sense of that debate? And do you think that's a, a you know, valid discussion that's going to keep happening or not? Well, one thing about that debate is we've, we've had it before. Um, after 9-11, uh, airlines were grounded and we um, you know, uh, came up with a, a, a package of uh, grants and loans for um, uh, the airlines. And along with it came some strings in the form of a, of a, of a board that supervised the distribution of the loans and loan guarantees and, and attached strings to those, those distributions. And my colleague Gordon Gray has a great paper on this. I encourage you to read it. Um, so in the past, we've had the precedent that you don't just get the money and do whatever you want. You have to satisfy this, this oversight board. Um, in this case, we don't appear to be creating a board, but there are going to be some strings attached. That's both a specific thing to the airlines and a general issue with, with what we're going to see in the way of this, this recovery package. Um, it, I personally think there is nothing wrong with making it a little bit painful to get government money to run your business. I mean, that's not how we like people doing things. And I don't have a, a deep aversion to having some requirements attached to the money that's going to go to airlines, to uh, defense related industries, to small businesses, to big businesses. We're going to give out a lot of money. Uh, I do think it should only prevail for the duration of the loan and the crisis. I don't think you should be doing permanent legislating of fundamental policies in the midst of a crisis and as a, a, a price of getting the loans. I think that's a mismatch that I don't like, but there, there are gonna be some stipulations, probably no buybacks during the course of the loan, that'd be fine. Could I, could, Doug, could I ask a question? It's Bill Hoagland. I, I agree with you, the airlines did, didn't do anything wrong, but how about the producers of airlines, Boeing? Well, I mean, if you have a gripe with um, uh, Boeing's um, past behaviors, whether it's the 737 MAX or anything else, I think that's an issue for the safety regulators. That's an issue for them for uh, either punishing through fines or something else. I, I don't think it's a reason to deny them the access to uh, a revenue source that keeps their employees at work getting their paychecks. In the end, it's not about Boeing or about United or about any of these particular companies. It's about the workers who work there and the need to protect them during the course of the pandemic, ensure they continue to get paychecks, which is the most efficient way to support the households that they live in. So I, I really don't think you should disqualify Boeing. Any of the other uh, speakers have questions for Doug? There's one or two uh, 
written ones I'll pose in a moment. All right, Doug, I'm going to convey a question from Jason Fickner, who's a no, I won't answer it. No, nope. next fellow here at the VPC. And, and Jason's question is whether the federal government's financial coverage should be equal to the operating expenses for a number of months or just try to cover payroll. I mean, how do you think the flow should match the need? Um, uh, I, I, I think the, the primary need here is to make sure the workers stay at work and that the infrastructure of the business survives the pandemic and we can then figure out how we're going to, to restart commerce on, a, on an effective way. Um, my instinct is that you should do the payroll. A lot of the rest of the operating expenses, whether it's um, rent or um, you know interest on loans for airplanes, things like that, is, go is going to be deferred as a matter of course anyway, and, and that the government doesn't need to pick up those costs. Okay, so we have a, a question um, from uh, Greg Wazowski with NPR Planet Money, which is kind of broadly um, relevant to a lot of the speakers. So I'm going to hold on it for now, Greg, let a few other folks um, engage, and then we're going to put that to the group. Um, all right, Doug, thank you for, uh, you know, thank you off the runway, so to speak. Um, <laughs> next, we have uh, two good friends from uh, Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, Bob Greenstein and Sharon Perot, who um, have a tandem presentation they are going to uh, share with us. And I, I'm not sure, uh, Bob or Sharon, who's taking the lead, but the mic is yours. Great, thanks. This is Sharon. Hi, everybody. It's nice to be with you. Um, I just want to point out that the, the, the current package that the Senate is working on isn't done. There's some language in flux. So I'm going to preface these remarks by saying, um, I might have more things, I, different things on my list, depending on where the ultimate language comes out. But I think we have a pretty good idea where things are going to work, where they're going to land. And so, right, the basic structure of the package are large one-time stimulus payments, a significant expansion in UI with the, both on the eligibility and the benefit side, funding for hospitals, funding for a number of current programs um, like child care and homelessness programs that can sort of assist with the immediate um, response. There are existing programs that can expand to meet greater need. Um, and then there are the big buckets um, of dollars, one sort of around particularly small businesses and one around um, some broad new authority for Treasury and the Fed um, around uh, loan, loan guarantees and equity investments um, to try to shore up businesses. Um, so assuming that that is actually where the package lands, um, I want to just talk briefly, I won't go in depth on any of these, about four things I think we need to focus on when we think about the next round of legislation, um, these are four things around helping struggling families um, and states, which is also related to helping struggling families. Uh, I'm not speaking about other things that might also be needed. So if I think about the four things uh, or four things, one is health care. It's actually quite striking that neither the C2 legislation, the, the last package, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, or the package they're working on right now, neither of those, um, neither of those really do anything on um, health care coverage. Um, and so we're going into a period where we're likely to see increases in the ranks of the uninsured at precisely the moment you would not want to see more people without coverage. The House um, as you all probably know, the House put out a package. Um, it won't get considered now. The Senate package presumably is uh, will get agreed to and then taken up in the House. But the House put together its own package, and it has some quite strong provisions around health. I won't go through those, but just in broad in broad strokes, I think the things that are going to take. Um, that it will take to try to expand coverage um, relates to increasing further the federal share um, of Medicaid that um, that the the the, sh the the share of Medicaid costs that the federal government um, pays for in order to stave off state interest in cutting Medicaid programs, um, new incentives uh, for states that have not adopted the Medicaid expansion to do so, so we get far more low-income adults covered, and some changes and improvements in the premium tax credits that help people afford marketplace coverage could really help as people lose jobs um, and need to transition to marketplace coverage. Um, 
I'll just underscore again that this is obviously an extraordinary time where we have a pandemic induced economic downturn and not doing things to expand coverage is going to mean that more people don't have health care coverage um, at a time when they need it most. So I think one big focus will need to be um, on actual health care coverage. The second um, is the SNAP program, what we used to call food stamps. Um, this package in the end does not include an increase in basic SNAP benefits. Um, this was something we did in the Recovery Act during the Great Recession. We raised basic SNAP benefit levels um, and the results are quite remarkable and strong. They staved off increases in poverty to a very large degree uh, during the Great Recession when looked at using broader measures of poverty. We also have evidence that they um, kept food insecurity from rising. We actually made a little bit of progress on food insecurity despite the recession. Um, and they were also quite, that benefit bump was also quite effective at generating um, overall boosts in consumer demand. So it was effective stimulus. That was uh, in play in this package. Um, as far as we know, it did not make it into the last package. It is a really important support for people um, when they're struggling with lower incomes. The third thing I want to talk about is that I think the next package will need to have a little bit longer term focus. We will have dealt with at least some really important near term issues, but none of the, we really haven't built anything in um, to the current uh, the current package that the Senate is working on that has relief measures that will last for the duration of the downturn. We don't know how long the downturn will last, but there's pretty big concern that unemployment's going to go way up and that it may not come way down super fast. We don't have a lot of experience of deep recessions and really steep recoveries. And so, you know, the UI expansions, um, the fiscal relief that's provided to states in the bill in the bill those things are all relatively short-lived in terms of you know they go through the end of the year they last some number of months uh, the increase in basic ui benefits is a four-month provision but there's nothing coming behind it that says if economic conditions stay down if the economy remains in recession um, that that a set of things kick in automatically or or are maintained automatically. And so just as an example, I think the next package is going to need to grapple with what is our stance on UI? What expansions do we need to keep in place at as long as economic indicators show that the economy is still in a negative posture? And similarly, this package will include some fiscal relief for states, we believe. Um, there's still details, I believe, that have not yet been locked down of exactly how that relief to states will work. But again, I think it will not be a permanent, not a permanent provision, but it won't be a provision that sort of provides fiscal relief as long as the economy remains in recession, but rather kind of a chunk of money for a fixed period of time that may well not be enough um, particularly for a recession that drags on any length of time at all. So I think this forward-looking, longer-term question will be really important in the next legislation. And then the fourth area, just briefly, is that there are going to be areas that it, we turned out not to have provided enough money for. Um, I think there are real questions about the what is going to what it's going to take around homelessness, both to prevent homelessness from rising and serving individuals experiencing homelessness in the midst of a pandemic. We may not have done enough there. There are going to be areas like that where we'll have to come back. The last thing I'll say is that well, legislation needs to be our needs to be an important focus. I just want to put a plug in for implementation. Implementing the package that the Senate has put forward is an enormous undertaking. Um, for any of you that were involved in 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 implementing the Recovery Act, imagine doing the Recovery Act during a pandemic when most people are teleworking and much of the country shut down. So there are lots of choices for states to make on various provisions. There's lots of provisions for the federal government itself to implement. It's a very very difficult time to do big new things and this is a lot of big new things all at once and so I would just urge that when we think about what's next there's a legislative piece that will be super important but there is also this whole question of implementation um, and how that goes but I'll, I'll stop there well thank you Jeff. really a great uh, opening to the next several months we are of course thinking about CV4 while uh, CV3 
hangs in the balance. Um, Bob, do you want to add anything to Sharon, or should we uh, open it up for a couple questions? Uh, I would open it up for questions. All right, well, I, ha I have one, but I'd like to see if any of the other panelists want to jump in first. All right, so Sharon, question to you, which is um, something we're thinking about a lot here at the BPC is, what kind of data are we going to have access to in order to start to answer in real time those questions you're raising? Right? I think we can know for certain that this piece of legislation is going to be a big mess. A lot of pieces are going to not work well. Some are going to be inadequate. Some um, we're going to want to extend. Um, have you thought at all about the process of bringing that kind of at least organized anecdote forward to the discussion as um, Congress comes back uh, probably in early May with the intention of another big piece of legislation? Yeah, it's a great question. So first of all, I just want to say that um, maybe it's just my need to get through the day, but I'd like to think that many of these provisions are going to work. We need them to work, and so I hope that the um, I hope that the what we get what we get out of this is not that the whole thing is a big mess. Um, I do think some of these things we we do have some experience with. Um, I think we're pretty good at doing stimulus payments. I think the big open question there is how many people will the Treasury decide has to uh, file a return when they have no other need to do so, and how good of a job do we get people to file returns? Um, I think on the business side, again, I, I defer to others that know those areas much more. I do think there are enormous implementation challenges, particularly on the small business uh, uh, paycheck prevention, uh, paycheck, paycheck protection piece of it. Um, and so that'll be important. Look, I think, um, I think a really big important thing is what happens on UI implementation in the first month. Those UI provisions are the thing that work are going to protect a tremendous number of workers that have lost their jobs. And I think tomorrow we will see claims for unemployment go way up. I think we have to be realistic about how quickly states are going to be able to process those applications and figure out the new pandemic unemployment assistance uh, eligibility. But that is going to be largely a state um, States are going to need to do that. I think it's going to be hard, but it's enormously important because that's how people are going to keep paying their bills. Um, and that's how they're going to be ready to engage in the economy when things reopen. So in terms of sort of data, I think a lot of it is going to be monitoring implementation on the UI side in states. Are, are, are claims getting processed? Are people getting the benefit bump? Um, that is included in the legislation, and are the ex eligibility expansions something that workers in the states are able to implement quickly? Um, I think that will be enormously important. I think those that will not be about data that gets so much. I mean, some of it we'll be able to tell by data because we'll be able to tell not just claims, but who's receiving unemployment benefits. But I think a lot of watchdogging is going to need to be done um, by people on the ground in states. Thank you, Sharon. Doug, you leaning in? Yeah, I have a question. I, I'm just curious how you think about the the role of these two new paid leave programs that were in the Families First legislation that the president's already signed into law. Um, those are fair, were fairly novel. I I think they raised a lot of these questions that, that Jason just surfaced on tracking them and seeing if they're working effectively or not. But I also wonder where they stand now that as a small business, I can get a paycheck protection loan keep that person on the payroll, I'd have to be paying them anyway, and then that loan will be forgiven. So I have a big incentive to do that. Is mm -hmm. anyone going to take those leave programs? Well, how should we think about them? Well, so the leave programs are really about people who aren't able to work. So they would stay connected to their employer, but they would have leave. So for example, um, the, the big the big expansion is in, it, there's the paid sick leave, which is 10 days of paid sick leave. for, And and so that's people who get sick or people who are caring for someone who's sick. Um, and you can also use it if your kid's school is closed. But then there's the 12 weeks um, of paid um, emergency uh, family leave. And that is really about people who aren't able to work because their um, kids are out of school. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of equity issues, by the way, in that because 
It applies if you have a kid who's not in school, but it doesn't apply if you have an adult dependent child who doesn't can't go to their adult day program anymore. So there are big equity issues sort of across. But I think the difference, Doug, is, and I, I'm not 100% sure actually how the two are going to work together, but I think the difference is those are people who are going to stay on your payroll, right? But they are now taking leave. So you aren't, um, uh, so they aren't working. Um, as opposed to people who are on your payroll and are still working. But you're right, I'm not sure how the two work together, but the paid leave yeah. is about a group of people who are on your payroll but not able to work because of very specific circumstances. So I, I think the, the interactive effects here is going to obviously be a focus for our community over the next uh, yeah. 10 days to, to 10 months. Um, I want to make Can sure I, uh, we go along. Yeah, Bob, uh, share your thought, and I'm going to ask uh, our I, next speaker to jump in. I wanted to underscore something Sharon talked about and where maybe some of the people on the call can help. Uh, I, I don't know how my email address has gotten out across the country. I'm getting a lot of emails, heartbreaking emails from low income people who were seriously disabled and are on Social Security Disability or SSI and they're all asking the same question. Um, they're saying, I'm seriously disabled, I'm home because of the pandemic, I can't get around much anyway. Um, I don't file a tax return, uh, how do I get a stimulus payment? And as we understand the language, let me back up. Uh, as Sharon can explain, it is eminently doable for the federal government, because we're talking about social security numbers, they can match people on Social Security and SSI against those who have filed a tax return, identify those who haven't, and send them a check. They don't need to make these people file a tax return, but the language is permissive, not mandatory. And I was just looking 10 minutes ago at the section by section that Senator Grassley, the Finance Committee put out, and it implies that no one who has not filed an 18 or 19 tax return gets the stimulus payment, meaning these people would have to file. Uh, so what do you do if you're uh, a, a seriously disabled person? You're at home, Vitacites and H&R Block are closed. You may not even know you have to file a tax return. So we're, we're hoping that a number of us can uh, plead with the administration and treasury and IRS to just do a simple data match and send these people a check rather than making, and we're talking about significant numbers of highly disadvantaged people missing out on the check because they don't know where to start in filing a tax return that as a number of these people are saying to me in emails, I haven't filed a tax return in years. I haven't been able to work in years. I'm seriously disabled. I'm on social security DI. So, Bob, I think it's a it's a uh, obviously compelling question, or you would not have um, raised it. And um, I doubt anybody has an immediate answer, but it's possible that Carl Smith with the Tax Foundation, who's next in our queue, might have a thought or two to share. Um, I also just want to note that really one of the main purposes of these discussions is to kind of elevate these kinds of questions that um, hopefully get us thinking more together and also enabling some some follow up work. But that's clearly high on the list, Bob. Um, so, Carl, with that uh, strained effort at Graceful Link, uh, are you with us? Carl, I think you may be on mute. Yes. Um, so, yes, I, I don't know if I if I have a a, a, a solid answer to that um, question, but I I want to talk a little bit about. Um, the sort of narrative around stimulus or the narrative around um, the Senate package. Um, and I think uh, there's a lot of talk, you know, so Jim Tankersley just had a, a piece this morning and you know, I hear this from other economists that we should just think about this as sort of like relief as something to sort of like hold people over, hold businesses over. We, we shouldn't think about it as stimulus. Um, and it has no sort of like aggregate demand effect or aggregate demand is not, not important to think about here. Um, and there's some there's some parts of that narrative that, that I agree with a lot. Um, so Larry Summers said, you know, uh, economic time is stopped, but not financial time, and that, I think that's important. Obviously, people have payments to make, and we need to 
to take care of that. We obviously want to keep businesses intact so that we don't lose valuable productive relationships. But I, I think there's also a case like for pure stimulus. And in that vein, you know, some of the typical types of things we do for stimulus, sending money to people, even if they're not necessarily in need or aggressive sort of quantitative easing um, that would uh, that would just think about as pure stimulus. And so I, I think there's sort of two two bad assumptions that underlie the notion that this is this is merely relief. One um, is that this is just a supply shock or that we should think about this as a supply shock. Um, and the second is that after the supply shock or during during the pandemic, um, during the quarantine, uh, supply is fixed at this lower shocked level. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on the first. I think the second is more important, but I, I would just mention it. Um, that I think that there's overwhelming evidence that it's not primarily a supply shock. Um, inflation expectations are falling. Uh, liquidity is drying up in, in financial markets. Uh, we see sort of layoffs, you know, occurring ahead of uh, when the uh, lockdowns are occurring or when businesses are being forced to close by um, by governments. Um, and then just sort of like casual empiricism says the sort of the effects of the spike of uncertainty are bigger than the effects of people sort of like purposefully distancing from either the CDC guidelines or the state or their state and local guidelines. Um, we don't see people saying, you know, treating this as a vacation. We see some people do, but not most people. And we don't see um, people saying that, you know, it's not, it's just not worth it to work because the virus is out there. There are obviously people saying that, but there are people who would want to work, but they, but they can't. Um, so I think I think the so overwhelming evidence of the demand the demand shock is, is much larger uh, than the supply shock. Right. Um, the other sort of I think more important assumption is that uh, is that supply is in some case fixed uh, because we don't want people to work. So we, we want people to stay home. That's important for fighting the pandemic. Uh, where I push back on that is that you know. Uh, essential services are open everywhere. Um, delivery businesses of all sorts of types are open in most places. Uh, there's there's some uh, parts of the country where there, there are very few restrictions. There is a, I think, coordinated thinking from, you know, the White House, from New York State, from other places that uh, there'll be like a phased relaxation of some of the, of some of the pandemic restraints. And so we have the opportunity for for some people to go out and work, and we also see that uh, essential services are like expanding employment. So like Instacart uh, is looking to hire 300,000 people, Walmart 100, 150,000, Amazon 100,000, and I think that that those sort of obvious grocery delivery services are um, are first, but they're not they're not the only thing that you can do under sort of a sophisticated quarantine. I think sort of expanding uh, sort of the touchless economy, as you might call it, um, to all sorts of goods and services is is a potential is potentially there that, that entrepreneurs can do that. Um, so a thing that I've talked about is like sanitized transportation. So can we have um, driver or cars that are that are sufficiently sanitized so people feel comfortable going in there? So Uber and Lyft and those types of things. Can we have uh, socially distance compliant daycare? So obviously we have a big childcare problem. But as we get people through who um, are who have antibodies to the virus can we get you know daycare solutions for people um, that would be social distance compliant um, can we get at home medical care so as we get you know um, physicians who are, who are who are immune to the virus as we get nurses who are immune to the virus you know having them go out to people's houses obviously you know uh, health clinic services these are sort of the obvious things that we can think about in terms of expanding uh, their capacity and doing it under the conditions of quarantine is likely to be more labor intensive than under normal conditions. And so we could see that all these things could, could demand more labor uh, than they do normally. And even beyond these things that we can sort of easily see and easily mention, I think that you know there, there's a potential for entrepreneurs to like figure out solutions that you know we, we can't even think of to some of these things, especially if we're facing the possibility of some types of restrictions lasting six months, nine months into next year. Um, there's even some talk about multiple waves coming back that there are entrepreneurs who can think about how can we operate you know, under these conditions. Um, and I think the important thing to remember about that is that having people respond to these structural constraints in ways that expand 
supply uh, happens best under really high pressure, under high demand pressure economy. And so the analogy that I want to make is back to uh, the Great Recession. And right after the Great Recession, there were all sorts of explanations about why unemployment was going to be permanently high, that we had uh, for a lack of skills, um, that we had people going on disability, and once they go on disability, they never come off of disability. We even had some serious work you know, showing that like uh, the improvements in video games were keeping people out of the labor market. But we saw all of those sort of like structural explanations melt in the face of continued strong demand, right? And strong demand, I think, even now can facilitate you know, a transformation to an economy that is more adapted to pandemic conditions. That's not saying that it can employ everyone. That's not going to say that there's still not going to be a massive, um, massive people on unemployment benefits, but we shouldn't think about it in simply in the sense of all we're doing is holding still. There's still like dynamism that can come. There's still um, ways in which entrepreneurs can expand. They can hire people back. And so what's the upshot of that? I think one of the upshots is that uh, there's concern, I mean, even out of, out of Deutsche Bank people that, you know, we should be cautious about the level of aggregate demand stimulus we do, especially with the Federal Reserve, because uh, inflation could be a problem coming out of this. I think that we should be, you know, extremely wary of that, not just because of the enormous shock to demand, but because I think the structure of the economy is more flexible. Um, another thing that I think we have to think carefully about, but uh, it's difficult, is um, incentives for people like not to work. So uh, how much we replace unemployment. Um, at this point, I mean, that's, that's not a hill I would die on to say that, you know, we shouldn't do uh, very large unemployment replacement. But uh, as we go forward, just thinking about these incentives in, in a general way and thinking about how we can promote sort of dynamism in the economy, I think will be important. Um, the third thing is how we think about sort of like the, the regulatory environment and um, all the focus right now or the key focus right now of many people is how do we lock down the virus, but like careful thinking about the barriers that might stand in the way for people operating during the virus, for people finding creative ways to employ people and to provide services during the virus, I think, uh, you know, transitioning in the in the weeks to come should be a major focus of how we think about dealing with this, how we think about creating, you know, new market relationships that can sustain people for however long we're going to be under under the pandemic. Carl, so that's thank you. Basically, yeah. I, uh, you know, thinking about the dynamism in the touchless economy is actually one of the more optimistic phrases that um, has passed through my mind in a little while. I really appreciate um, putting this on the table because I think we all agree we're going to be doing this for longer than uh, our social safety net alone is going to be able to uh, to handle. I want to. Um, Recognize that we have, I think, five more presentations and uh, about 50 minutes. And so we are not off schedule, but I wouldn't say that we're exactly on schedule either. And therefore, I want to kind of push forward and see if we obviously can have some interaction between the discussions. And then we have a couple of meta questions uh, on the queue here that I want to pose at the end. With that, Sarah Artell. I know you've been thinking about a lot of stuff. Last we talked, you said you might share some thoughts about housing, but uh, the screen is yours. Thank you. Uh, and thanks uh, to BPC for doing this, Jason. Really, uh, it's a great forum for folks. Um, so I do want to talk about housing, and I want to talk in particular about the rental market side of housing, because I think one of the um, byproducts of the mortgage market crisis was that a lot of uh, intellectual infrastructure and relationships between industry and consumers and others was built during that crisis and people are thinking robustly about the mortgage market and solutions there. Um, but I actually think the problem of this pandemic is going to be much more acute for renters and uh, the um, intellectual infrastructure for working through problems is not nearly as well trafficked. Um, and so it's really important to get people thinking there. It does look like, Sharon, that um, I will say that I've, I've seen a version of the bill that has um, provisions that are being uh, tweaked as we speak um, on both the single family mortgage side and the rental side. They are modest in duration and in particular on the rental side, they only cover 
the um, government guaranteed markets, which are the FHA and the GSE loans. And at best, that's half the market. Um, it depends on how you count new volume. It's probably about uh, under a third, but number of outstanding loans and the number of units, my gut tells me, uh, I'm still trying to parse through the data, that's only about um, half. Um, and who are the people in those homes? Uh, 42 million rental households with median household income of 41,000. Um, their monthly housing cost is on average 31% of their rental income. And there is 27% of those folks who, um, I'm sorry, yeah, there are 27% of those, I'm sorry, 20% of those folks who, um, I keep, I'm looking at the wrong number here, um, I'm sorry, uh, 11 million of them are paying more than half their income in rent. So uh, the tenants are the folks whose incomes are most vulnerable at the bottom of the market and most likely to stop needing to stop pay uh, almost immediately. And this is actually personal for me because I have a, a family we're close of two rent restaurant workers whose income has come to a complete halt uh, two and a half weeks ago. And they're trying to decide, do they pay for diapers and food or um, do they pay their uh, rent payment today? And um, I will make sure they have diapers and food, but the uh, this is a every household kind of concern. Um, eviction relief, which a number of jurisdictions have taken, isn't enough because uh, the renter still owes the money. And for the most part, when wages resume, if they resume, they're not going to be likely to fill the hole. And the landlords are going to face costs uh, maintenance and staff, insurance, property taxes that without the rent they're not going to be able to provide. Um, and the owners of these properties are a very diverse set of folks. The one thing about mortgage market is it's largely handled through relatively fixed number of uh, lenders. But the um, if you think about who our property owners are, they're small businesses. They are some large REITs um, that are financed by pension funds, insurance companies, overseas investors, and your local community bank. So this is an extremely diverse market. Um, so I'm going to make the case, and I have not worked this all the way through, that by the time we get to bill four or five, we will be talking about some kind of broad stroke rent forbearance that is broader than what is just covered by the GSEs and FHA. And the, you know, this concept is basically intertemporal cross-subsidization where our future selves are going to pay the rents for many of our current homeowners. Um, one of the big problems is it's very hard to ascertain who are the people who are in distress in this context. Um, and so you're really going to have to um, be less precise than we would like to be because the administrative burden of figuring out who in fact has hardship um, with income is going to be overwhelming and could bring us to some pause. The bill itself seems to have a very light um, administrative responsibility for the half that it tacked tackles on the rental side, I mean on the mortgage side, and they're going to have to come up with something similar on the rental side. Um, so we're talking about some kind of program that ideally covers, doesn't matter who owns you the mortgage on the building you live in, it's somewhat consistent across buildings, um, and that it is something that is going to say, if you're in distress and you can't pay your mortgage, that or I'm sorry, pay your rent, that obligation is going to be deferred and eventually, um, uh, I think, forgiven. But that means that the landlord has to be get relief for paying their mortgage payments and that the person they owe those payments to is going to have to have access to some kind of treasury or Fed window through the JCs. It may mean that the liquidity backstop that they have um, uh, in the treasury continues to sort of fill the hole. Same thing with FHA and Ginny May. But for the rest of this market, we're going to have to come up with some structure through the Fed and Treasury windows where um, people can provide uh, security. And um, a lot of people are thinking about using small business lending for some, some of the smaller property owners with what will end up being essentially forgivable loans if conditions are met. Um, so I'll stop there and just say that um, uh, there's a lot of complexity. I don't know what the right design is on most of the issues I raise. But I suspect that both financial market stability will require that the housing market 
come to some equilibrium on this. And at the end of the day, it's the individual families who are paying the, making those rent payments who for some period of time, and it may, as Sharon said, be longer than just the duration of the quarantines and the lockdowns um, are probably going to see their ability to make rent payments be vastly diminished if the property owners and the lenders um, uh, are required to bear that burden without cost sharing from the taxpayers, we're going to see their liquidity dry up and the housing market come to a screech and that will make the duration of the crisis longer. Thank you, Sarah. As we discussed uh, by email, housing is the um, monstrous wicked challenge that has not fully arrived and I really wanted and appreciate you kind of putting it on everybody's agenda. Um, any uh, Quick uh, comments or questions from Sarah. I, I will remind those of you who joined recently that this signal, which I believe is up right now on the upper right of your screen, allows you to uh, text in a question. We have a couple in the queue that I'm going to get to here in a moment. But um, anyone want to follow up quickly with Sarah? All right, well, I'm looking forward to the urban paper um, coming up with all the design answers to those small questions that you raised. And um, I think next uh, on the list, uh, we have uh, Andrew Biggs with AEI who wants to talk a little bit more about the uh, UI system, which I think relates to a couple of the pending questions in the queue. So I'll let Andrew, you make this presentation, then we'll refer to those. Hey, thanks. This is Andrew here. Um, I'll try to be quick, and I think I can. Um, I think my idea is either so good or so obvious that it looks like something uh, resembling it is going to happen. Um, when I started thinking about uh, you know policies in this area for the combating the coronavirus, what I was thinking of was really two things. First is proposals that are easy to administer in the sense that you can get the the, the spending done quickly. Um, but second is targeted in the areas of the need uh, where, where it's greatest, just because of the sort of the unique nature of the economic shock that we're, we're suffering uh, due to COVID-19. Uh, my own idea was that if, you, if you've got a policy that satisfies these criteria, it's going to be more cost effective, meaning it's going to help the economy better, and it's also going to leave more resources available for all the other policies we're going to need to fight the coronavirus. Um, my idea specifically was to increase the generosity of state unemployment insurance benefits. Uh, specifically, uh, UI benefits typically replace about half of earnings up to a maximum of around $450 per week. I argued several weeks ago in an article for Forbes that we should think about raising both the replacement rate and the maximum weekly benefit. You know, as, a, as an example, UI benefits might be increased to replace 85% of prior earnings with a maximum weekly benefit of $1,000. That's going to increase the replacement rates at the bottom end, but also push benefits higher up the income ladder than they ordinarily would be. <clears throat> Obviously, these benefits are going to be well targeted. These are going to deliver benefits to the workers who have been furloughed or laid off as a result of, of the coronavirus and help allow them to better maintain their standard of living. But obviously, it goes beyond just a, a uh, sort of a, a charitable or a welfare function in the sense that increasing UI benefits would help prevent mortgage or other loan defaults, losses to landlords due to non-payment of rent, follow-on job losses as the unemployed households reduce their consumption. Um, but also, in theory at least, the increased UI benefits could uh, be implemented quickly. And I think that's really important as we think about, you know, Congress is moving very quickly uh, uh, these days to pass a bill, but it's less clear to me how quickly some of these policies can actually be implemented. And it's the implementation that really matters. Um, in, in theory, states could simply change a few lines of software code and determine UI benefits and start paying those higher checks immediately. I know that in practice, and some of this goes back to you know, the last recession, it's not always that simple. And obviously, the state UI agencies today are overwhelmed with new benefit claims. Even then, though, I, I believe that boosting unemployment could still end up being a quicker response to COVID-19 than some of the others are being discussed. 
Um, at this point, I have not argued for extending the duration of UI benefits, which is a, a common a strategy used. I mean, that may be necessary in the future, depending on how things evolve. But at this point, I think making UI benefits generous but shorter-lived may help in building a rebound from you know, the inevitable downturn we're facing. Um, I have not yeah. seen a score on raising UI benefits, and it's going to depend on the, the, the economic situation, but I still think this would leave plenty of money for policies help small businesses and you know, everybody else who's been affected in various ways by the quarantines. So I'll leave it at that, but I appreciate the, the chance to talk to you all today. Terrific. So um, while well, folks are thinking whether they have a question, I want to um, pull one up from our uh, little feed here from uh, Niv Ellis at the Hill, which is not precisely on point to your comments, but very relevant to the broader discussion, which is the question about whether the generosity of a six hundred dollar uh, a month unemployment incentive could actually create the undesired incentive for people to choose unemployment over work, since in many cases that's a higher wage than many folks are receiving uh, in their 40 hour a week current employment. And I just wonder whether you or Doug or anyone else has thoughts just about, you know, we will always raise these moral hazard questions as we race to deal with this kind of crisis. But um, and do you have thoughts I mean, about right that now, or anyone else on the line? Yeah, I mean, it's you know you can't UI benefits don't get go to people who quit their jobs. So yeah. um, it's going to be come people who are involuntary on un, unemployed. Oh you know, yes, I mean you know there's various research looking at how UI benefits, either the replacement rate or the duration, affects return to work, and you know th those those things matter. But you know we have a situation today in which we're literally ordering businesses <laughs> to close their doors. So th this huge influx of people uh, on the unemployment rolls we're seeing today, you know, th th these are not people doing it by choice. Um, so you know th th this is where unemployment is, is playing a true insurance function. I think if you make them generous, but also keep it short-lived, then you know if the economy rebounds, the, the incentives will remain. Um, to get back to work, but it's really just going to depend on you know where we are a month or two months or three months from now, and obviously we just don't know the answer to that. Okay. Any other uh, questions for Andrew? All right. Well, while uh, introducing uh, Ben Ritz, a uh, dear friend and colleague of VPC and at the Progressive Policy Institute, I want to also just acknowledge for Greg and others who have asked some really compelling meta questions that I think all speakers will have a view on. I'm going to hold those, uh, hoping that we have some time at the end for that broader conversation. Um, ben, I think uh, we gave you the uh, very, very telling uh, title on this uh, agenda, Next Steps for the Stimulus. So that really narrows down your area of focus. Uh, I turn it over to you to uh, tighten that up for us in the next several minutes. Thanks, Jason. Uh, so I think one of the big questions that we've been seeing revolving around what the right approach to the crisis is, is in terms of do we want to target relief towards those who are most in need, uh, which has the, the benefit of being efficient, but at the same time can, can take a lot longer and can leave people out? Or do we want to just go big and broad, you know, the, the send everybody a check approach um, which uh, you know has the benefit of making sure that it, nobody is left out. It's it's relatively fast, but at the same time, it's it's a lot more uh, expensive, and it's you're likely to have a situation where you're providing benefits to people who don't need them, and you're not providing uh, benefits that are big enough to the people who do. And so one approach, so the general approach that we've been advocating at PPI is to try to send the money out now as quickly as possible to as many people who need it and do targeting retroactively through uh, next year's tax returns. The, the original proposal we had for this was to essentially structure the, uh, the universal stimulus checks as a uh, refundable tax credit, send it out to everybody now, and then uh, higher income taxpayer, for higher income taxpayers, uh, it would be treated something like a, a low interest, no interest loan they get for a year and they pay it back next year. Uh, and this would allow lawmakers to uh, send big broad checks now while having no concern that, uh, you know, for higher income people, it would it would eventually get repaid. Uh, this is somewhat 
similar to, I think actually the House bill that they put out on Monday uh, had a very similar structure to this. The the Senate bill with its uh, the the recovery rebates now is sort of the the opposite of this in that uh, it sends out payments now based on your income from 2019 or 2018 and then uh, doesn't claw it back next year. And so that has the, the downside of, uh, you know, for somebody who was high income and is now low income, they have to, uh, they won't get the benefit for several months. Whereas uh, other people, if they're fortunate enough to see a big income increase uh, between 2019 and 2020, uh, they'll get a benefit and not have to pay it back. And so we think that going forward, uh, it's important to try to uh, target these benefits, but also not let that hold uh, hold up getting getting payments out. And we think a similar logic can be applied on the business side. Uh, something like the this is not very different from the uh, the small business provision in the the stimulus bill as we understand it now, where uh, small businesses would get loans to help them make payroll, and then if they uh, retain their workforce and, and are unable to pay the loans back, it gets forgiven. Um, we just think that that's, that's an important approach of, of trying to be quick and, and get the money out there while at the same time, uh, you know, trying to target it where we can in ways that don't slow out the, uh, the, the sending of payments. The, the last point I'll make on this is that I, I haven't given a lot of thought to this since it's only a, a relatively recent issue that's popped up but I, I've started to think about whether a similar structure might be able to resolve the standoff we're seeing right now on the unemployment benefits, where uh, you have some Republican senators who are concerned about the fact that uh, giving the $600 a week increase in unemployment benefits is going to result in some people getting a higher than 100% uh, wage replacement rate. And then at the same time, you have uh, experts saying that there is no way to uh, functionally do a 100% replacement rate cap through the UI system without without taking a, a long time to work through uh, the system. So I am wondering if there is a way we can send these broad benefits out now and then, uh, you know, do some sort of retroactive adjustment through the tax code next year that would um, allow uh, the imposition of some sort of 100% uh, replacement rate cap to deal with some of those incentive concerns. So. That's the that's the general approach we have for for next steps for stimulus, but um, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what we're thinking. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ben. The the possibility for both you know urgency and precision I think makes that um, graceful. I know it's already been an active part of the discussion. Um, I'm going to go by House rules and skip over our very own Bill Hoagland um, for a moment and see if we can get the. Uh, the Brookings quad chair of uh, Mark, Tim, Amy, and Zav um, to hop on. There's been, I think, quite a bit of uh, thought gone into your uh, discussion about some of these key regional issues and some of the disaster relief mechanisms. And so I was going to ask if uh, if you all would jump in, we'll then let uh, Bill bring us home. And I think we will have time for 10 minutes of uh, some of the larger questions that have been raised uh, on the chat line. So Mark, to you. Well, Great. Uh, really? but actually, I think Amy Lou, my colleague, will start us out, then I will go very briefly, and then the incredible Tim Bartik will follow up and Don Briggs will close. Fantastic. Very impressive. Great. So Amy. this is... This is this is great. Thank you. This is Amy, and I really appreciate you giving us the opportunity to uh, present two related uh, policy ideas uh, to one really important matter, which is how do we... Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. Yeah, good now. Okay, I think, great. Mark, uh, keep your mic muted and we'll be good. Okay, great. So anyway, Mark, Tim, Zav, and I are going to present two related um, sets of policy ideas that address um, a topic that we think are really important, uh, which is the need for massive, massive fiscal relief to states and local economies. And you know, the risk of not doing so is even you know, more damage to the delivery of care and essential public services and to the length and geography of employment and economic declines across the country. And so what you're going to get um, is first, the first idea is going to be presented by Mark and Tim, um, which, which is going to relate to how the federal stimulus 
or other federal policy interventions can address the geographic divides in our country. And then Zav Briggs will expand on a piece that we both co-authored uh, about how the federal aid can flow through proven channels uh, as we've seen in the past through major disasters. Um, so the first thing I was gonna do though is just really reinforce the importance of state and local governments. Now, beyond being on the front lines of the response and being on television and cable television every day, um, per my colleagues at the Brookings Hutchins Center, what we know is that state and local governments also represent about 13% of total employment in the United States, and state and local tax revenues make up about 9% of GDP. So once these governments uh, are forced to make cuts due to lost revenues, uh, uh, given the, sh the lockdowns in most states now, and due to increased spending, what, uh, which is what we're seeing in this environment, we're gonna have some real impact on the nation's overall economy. And yesterday, for instance, we learned that the governor of Ohio announced a 20% across the board budget cut to offset new spending and revenue losses. And given the balanced budget requirements, um, I anticipate this uh, budget, balanced budget requirements that uh, all states have to follow. I anticipate that we're gonna see this trend uh, continue over time. And what we've learned is during the Great Recession between 2009 and 2012, cuts in state finance spending lowered real GDP growth about 1.2 percentage points. And I know Tim may offer other estimates that he's run uh, based on um, what are anticipated state cuts if uh, unemployment really continues to rise. So what's happening is that what we're seeing right now across the country is that while state and local governments are waiting for federal aid to flow, they are really front loading emergency spending right now. Um, so most state legislatures have enacted emergency spending measures to cover public health, to house the homeless, to shore up food banks, to shore up nonprofits and other critical assistance. And we're seeing local governments doing the same setting up emergency funds for workers and small businesses in partnership with philanthropy. And what I'm observing is that all of these vehicles are um, probably only going to be, you know, solvent for um, a couple of weeks um, without those federal, uh, the need for flexible federal aid. Um, but the positive thing is they are providing a really critical delivery infrastructure in which federal resources can reach real people and real businesses uh, in main streets across America. And I will, as a lot of others have done, I'll just say a few words about the draft Senate agreement. Um, there is um, aid for states in there. There's a $150 billion state stabilization fund run out of treasury. There is some expansion in the CDBG. Uh, there is an expansion of the disaster relief funds by $45 billion. I think what you're gonna hear from my colleagues on the call here is that um, that aid overall is not big enough, it is not flexible enough, and it does not recognize the structural challenges that most distressed communities face uh, in an economic downturn. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Mark, who's gonna re really reinforce the geographic nature of this virus's effect. Mark? Mark, you're on mute, buddy. Yeah, that this is Mark. I just wanted to uh, thank Amy, thank all of Jason and Andrew as part of bipartisan and all, everyone on uh, this urgent time. I just want to uh, reinforce one other uh, problem that the four of us especially are very concerned about, and it is the uh, concern that temporary regional damages incurred with the usual and evenness of recessions across places can easily become long-term and even you know, permanent setbacks. So I wanna just underscore the urgency of the whole issue of state local uh, relief and, and with an eye towards the regional impact. Um, thinking here is really darkened uh, as um, the economic profession, demographers and regional scholars have really dug into not just the last three recessions, but especially the aftermath of the last one. Conventional wisdom had always been that economic shocks, you know, 
even into the last decade, tended to assume that regions naturally recovered, that they bounced back in some way, and that workers and, and economies will adjust. Um, that has proven uh, much harder to see in the evidence and uh, significant work in the last decade is prompted especially by the uneven and very slow response from the financial crisis in some regions to raise really you know, somber issues uh, about this kind of benign story of adjustment. Uh, research by two of our colleagues, Brad Hirschbein and Brian Stewart, uh, shows that communities more severely affected during recessions continue to suffer relative to less effective areas for at least a decade afterwards. Hard hit areas experience larger relative losses of employment, population, and earnings. The share of the population with jobs falls. Likewise, economist Danny Yagan has shown that whole regions were still struggling to adjust even a decade after the last recession. And then, in fact, just recently, uh, our program's Metro Monitor show that there are still 104 uh, MSAs out of the nation's 383 metro areas that, as of 2019, had not recovered their 2007 level of, of employment. So the latest work is not reassuring uh, on uh, what happens when, when uh, after these events. Whole regions may well be following into traps of underdevelopment is, is really one of the, the concerns here, where underperforming regions begin to lose their capacity to catch up with the frontier regions at all. So that's why I'm, I'm gonna hand this over to Tim at the Upjohn Institute and then Sav Briggs of NYU. We're gonna discuss two possible policy responses, each which aims really to bolster state and local government's ability to counter these dynamics and also then to help in general, generally help regions avoid being temporary pain turned into permanent harm, which really is the long-term concern here. Tim? Okay, uh, Tim Bardick here. Can you all hear me? We can hear you, Tim. A little bit of an echo. Okay. Well, I don't know why there's an echo, but, but uh, hopefully it goes away. Um, Okay, I just want to provide first some facts to back up the argument that, as I understand it, in the Senate bill, there's $150 billion in state and local government aid, and the basic argument is that it's not big enough, it's not flexible enough, and it's not regionally targeted enough, so we'll have to, you know, hopefully in some subsequent bill we can address some of those issues. On the big enough front, um, state and local own source general revenue in the U.S. is it's about $2.4 trillion a year. If that goes down 10% due to this uh, uh, current economic crisis, that's a loss of $240 billion to state and local governments in revenue. And then there's probably at least another 100 to 200 billion in extra cost, some of which are due to healthcare related things, but other which are just due to the economic downturn and, and the various social services that requires. So I think the 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 need for state and local governments is much higher than 150 billion. On flexible, as I understand the current legislation, it funds extra services necessitated by the virus, but doesn't allow covering like uh, the revenue shortfall and covering your regular services. So it's going to lead to some. If if this is all that is done, it will lead to some pretty strange state and local policies. You'll be laying off police and fire and teachers and other personnel while you have some funds to add extra public health services, which is not uh, the best either for the economy or for local public services. And finally, I recently targeted, um, my understanding is the current allocation is mostly uh, per capita, but there's going to be a very differential regional pattern of this particular recession. It's going to hit... Uh, uh, the Brookings people have, have documented this, as well as other folks uh, are documenting this. It will affect tourism and travel industries, energy. Um, it will be a very uneven effect, as usually happens to the recession. And on that last point, as Mark mentioned and Amy alluded to, um, we know that regionally severe recessions have permanent damaging effects. I mean, if a region experience, if a, if a local metro area experiences 5% more employment loss during the recession than the national average, 
even 10 years later, their employment is still 6% lower. They get back to the, maybe their previous growth path, but they don't recover the employment that's lost. And that may even be a permanent effect. They will permanently have lower employment. The uh, employment rate, the employment to population ratio, will be two percentage points lower uh, at least 10 years later. It may be permanently. And that's one of the reasons why we have these big regional economic differentials from these region-specific shocks we've had over time. Uh, and that's not inevitable, though. That's partly because we don't fund public services during a recession adequately, and we don't deal with some of the damage that recessions, particularly regional, regionally severe recessions, do to workers' job skills and other social problems. So what we propose is three things. One, um, we propose some large and flexible state and local fiscal aid. Uh, we're talking about a magnitude greater than what's currently being proposed, more than $250 billion, uh, $400 billion, maybe $500 billion. Uh, it needs to be a lot higher. And um, we're also proposing that that be provided flexibly because we have a rev we don't just have a problem with extra health care costs. We have a problem with a, a revenue cliff that state and local governments are dropping off of. We also think that we need to have some tax credits to encourage payroll maintenance and expansion. After this, this thing is over and we do want to increase employment and get people back to work, we need to have some payroll credits to encourage employers to expand, and that can be regionally targeted at the hardest-hit regions. And finally, there's going to be a lot of dislocation and moves to different industries, and we're recommending expansion of regionally focused job training to help the hardest-hit regions adjust. So those are the three elements. We need to avert, you know, regionally severe recessions by by aid that is flexible and large and that deals with the payroll problem and then uh, help with job training to adjust. Let me just stop there. I love people who give it big frameworks on complex data sets. Um, Zav, uh, I'm wondering if you are online. Jason, I'm here. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I'll pick up right where Tim left off. So complementing this um, uh, approach, as Mark and Tim just outlined, to recognize regional differentiation in risk and uh, loss and or likely loss and recovery prospects, Amy and I worked with Jenny Schuetz to put together a proposal that essentially asked for two things and outlines how to achieve them. One is coordination, of course, and the second is money. Um, and where coordination is concerned, obviously you can't enact it, but there is an established framework for disaster relief and recovery. It gives uh, government at all levels uh, substantial flexibility when it's used intentionally and communicated clearly, and that is the Stafford Act and the disaster framework. Um, the problem is when President Trump issued a national emergency declaration on March 13th, it was written quite narrowly to focus um, on the public health emergency, and in fact, on only certain aspects of it, not to recognize the multifaceted crisis that this is, in which a, a health emergency and an economic crisis feed each other in, in both directions, and will continue to do so in ways that are tricky to forecast right now. So the first recommendation is expand that national emergency declaration, put all of government on notice, the disaster response and recovery folks call it a whole of government approach or a whole of government frame, but put government on notice at all levels that this is a multifaceted crisis and the disaster relief and recovery framework uh, is built for you know, cross-functional coordination and um, emergency operation centers and a whole variety of things that are extremely useful for addressing the full range of things we've talked about on this call and, and more. Um, the second thing we call for is money. It uh, would answer at least part of the huge gap that Tim just scaled for us or estimated for us, and we called for money of two kinds. Uh, the first is uh, sort of conventional disaster relief and response money um, in the form of the disaster relief fund. As of late February, there was a balance of about $42 billion that's already appropriated money, but states were getting no clear direction on how to apply or how to shape their programs. Good news is, as of Friday, New York State became the first to get a a major disaster declaration, as it's called, from the White House, and they are starting to draw down on that. The Senate package announced this morning includes another slug of $45 billion, so that's a good thing and that's a good start. The second type of money we call for, though, is basically revenue sharing um, as flexible and fast as possible for all the reasons discussed so far. 
and we suggested, we recommended um, 100% um, federal match of Medicaid costs for the duration of the crisis. Bob and his team and others have um, uh, spoken very thoughtfully and outlined a number of different options for doing this, not necessarily the way we describe, but Medicaid is the single, the Medicaid match is the single biggest source of federal revenue for state governments. Um, it's a very well established channel to, to Amy's point. Um, it would be nothing like this de novo uh, treasury program, which the Senate package includes that's, that's never been run before so far as I know, at least in the terms it's described in the package. Um, and the second channel also well established, the closest thing we have to federal local revenue sharing in America would be to appropriate a large amount for HUD's community development block grant program use the formula that already exists, which does adjust for need. It's not just based on population scale. It would address some of the targeting that Tim and Mark just talked about as well. Um, and it, uh, you know, is a well-established way of getting money directly to local government so they're not going um, like beggars to their states um, to get an allocation of some of what states get. And one could do that uh, quickly and also write in waivers to make it more flexible, track what you spend on, use it for a whole array of things connected to this crisis, um, but you don't have to submit a plan in advance, et cetera, et cetera, and go through the traditional hoops. Uh, Jason, I'll end there. Thank you. Well, thank you to the four of you. I think um, regional frame and kind of location, location, location is obviously something that's gonna be on all of our minds going forwards. Um, are there questions to the, uh, Brookings quad that uh, anybody wants to put out there before our last presentation. I guess the, the, the one um, Zav that I'll offer to you and the team is um, lessons learned saying we want access to that great efficient US disaster relief program um, raises some questions just based on recent history and the inefficiency of our ability to bring aid to people under, you know, more obvious kinds of distress. Um, how do you think about uh, that analogy and what do we need to do to make this disaster response work better than what we're still struggling with with Houston and Puerto Rico and the rest? Jason, it's an important question. In those instances, of course, where you have a physical shock and all of its cascade effects um, uh, on, on human lives and health and, and all the rest, um, a, a lot of what explains the slow spend out uh, after, you know, states and, and uh, state and local leaders, of course, argue strongly for the maximum possible allocation they can get. A lot of what explains the slow spend out is the fact that you're uh, rebuilding physical facilities, you're deciding on, in some cases, things like urban redevelopment and arguing over how much you should rebuild as you rebuild what you had versus build smarter in ways that are more climate resilient. Obviously, those are important debates, but they tend to slow things down. Um, there's a host of things that go into the use of FEMA monies for reconstructing facilities or a special version of HUD CDBG, which is for disaster recovery, helped rebuild lower Manhattan after 9-11, for example, New Orleans after Katrina, um, that really would not be an issue here given the kinds of critical needs that we're that we're talking about on this call the country is you know is seeing evolve uh, minute by minute great context thank you so uh bpc's very own bill hoagland uh is last in the queue to add a few thoughts um we told bill that it wasn't until the next call that he could start talking about the spiraling national debt he has to be part of the stimulus discussion here at least for another 72 hours well and okay. so uh Bill? I'll, I'll try. I, I always put the budget guy at the end of these uh, very good presentations. And I, I, I do but I do want to focus on the stimulus payments real quick, see if I can get us back on time to, uh, for you to uh, ask your mega questions. Uh, but listen, I, 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 as an old budgeteer, I cannot, I cannot resist the chance just to simply point out uh, that this is exactly what many of us uh, feared would be the situation. We didn't fix the roof when the sun was shining and uh and for the day when the rain came and here we are we entered this uh, pre uh cobus uh, crisis with a trillion dollar def deficits and for as long as we could see 80 percent of gdp debt to gdp now the current crisis does require um bold and quick action 
However, this is again is not the time to be concerned about the level of stimulus needed, uh, but but I have to say coming out of this crisis at some point we will have accumulated significantly more debt. Uh, government spending will have been ratcheted up and unwinding that level of debt and spending will be much more difficult than it, it was even pre crisis. And I just for put one factoid here, we spend four point seven trillion dollars annually. Uh, assuming the $2 trillion, and it's probably more than $2 trillion stimulus package, and assuming it all spins out quickly, which is important, if it is going to be a stimulus package, that means we, we've increased spending in the uh, in one year 42%, unprecedented. However, I want to again emphasize that it's uh, it's necessary under the current situation. I think, I think there is an inherent contradiction between what we want from economic policy at this time, stronger economic growth, the invert an extended recession or even depression, and what we want with health policy, slower growth or no growth at all to reflect the population sheltered in place until this virus in a, is a, comes under control. And we see that tension already playing out between the president and his health professionals. So this brings me to uh, the payments to individuals. I was not a fan of Social Security payroll tax uh, rollback, and so I'm pleased that the package today follows the historic patterns of the past, the Tax Reduction Act of 1975, uh, but more importantly and more relevant, the Economic Stimulus Act of 2008, um, which did provide a maximum credit of $1,200 for joint filers. But this tension I mentioned between appropriate health policy and an economic stimulus did not exist in 2008. It was a financial crisis needing economic stimulus. Even then, research indicated that the payments in 2008 uh, probably increased consumption, particularly for low-income families, no more than 6%. I've seen other figures that maybe 25%, but overall, not a big dollar for dollar, a lot of it went into savings. And we know that 70% of uh, of GDP is consumption. So if consumption represents $14 trillion of our economy in normal times, uh, as, uh, these direct payments of between 250 and maybe it, it'll be higher than that, maybe it'll be about 500. That's up to 3% of consumption. Chalk me up as, uh, uh, as not exactly uh, salient. Or, uh, so I, I, I'm not sure that's going to have as big an impact on economic growth going forward as maybe the people who are advancing it think. But again, I'll, I'll say that payments will be important, paying mortgages, rent, food, that's all. I think there are a lot of the other benefits in this package, the four month enhanced UI benefits, the credit against employees, the retention credits for holding on to employees. I think it's more of a psychological impact than it will be in these payments. So if I understand the, the final agreement, uh, Today, a one time $1,200 for individual filers, $2,400 uh, for uh, joint filers, five plus $500 credit. Um, I think uh, that is uh, helpful. Uh, but at BPC, we argued that uh, payments be timely, targeted, and temporary. I think the final agreement meets these criteria, but I also think, as has been mentioned so many times already on this call today, uh, there's another COVID-4, COVID-5 coming uh, that may attempt to extend these payments later into the year, and therefore they would not be temporary. So therefore, my one idea, Jason, is uh, as follows. Once those current payments have been distributed, IRS estimate how much of the payments were received by those who qualified or would have qualified for the EITC, not mentioned at all in anybody's comments today, then adjust the EITC tax maximum tax benefit, maximum benefit to the level of the current law, EITC plus the 2020 credit, and adjust the phase out percentage to be consistent with the 75,000 and 150,000 phase out period in the current law. Uh, this would target be more targeted, as Ben has talked about earlier, a universal basic income. Uh, in the near term, some might argue that this would allow employers to hold back on wages. I bet there won't be a lot of wage increases coming after this. And more importantly, the benefit would be particularly helpful for those single individuals with no children out there where their maximum EITC benefit today is $538. That's it, Jason. I'm sorry. We're running out of time. That's good stuff. And I got to say, I, I'm charmed that those of you who know Bill Hoagland know that I'm charmed to see that he's got the he's got the BPC swag logo banner behind his desk at home. That's 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 compelling good stuff. Um, all right, we got about five minutes left. Um, I have a couple of closing thoughts, but before that, I've been um, teasing uh, 
Greg with NPR Planet Money that we were going to put his big questions to the group as kind of the wind up here. And he basically has two. One is anyone have thoughts about how these efforts to basically put a pause on payments is going to um, have ramifications going forward through the economy. Um, and then the second is the kind of hopes, dreams, and fears question. What uh, do people think is the greatest uh, source of optimism, anxiety, and uncertainty that uh, we are going to be grappling with as a thought community and helping Congress um, think through when they come back from recess? So I open it up for basically any kind of final closing thoughts from any of our speakers. So that's a uh, share. I guess I'll go ahead. Oh, OK. Um, I guess this is Ben. I'll jump in. I guess I'll say that my my case for optimism is I think that the the stimulus bill that we have now and the one that we got in the last round were both uh, appropriately sized for for the challenge that we face in the near term. And I'm hopeful that we can get uh, stimulus as needed. Uh, going forward and that we won't be too constrained like we were in 2008. And I guess my biggest fear is that if we don't get the actual virus under control, and it seems like there's been a lot of uh, mistakes made by the administration on the public health side, that uh, if that continues, then we're going to have much bigger economic problems than, than we're currently expecting at the moment. Sharon? Sure. So uh, I think all of us could list a lot of fears. So um, and we at the Center on Budget do fear really well. So I'm going to I'm going to not do that. I'm going to I'm going to try to uh, be on the hope and optimism side, um, which would shock my colleagues. Um, I, you know, I think we have seen um, look, it's been hard to reach this agreement. There's still things in flux, but we have seen a commitment to bolder action, certainly than we saw in the Recovery Act. Um, and I think that reflects both the nature of this crisis uh, and that we maybe actually did learn some lessons from the Recovery Act. So it was a very partisan, remained very partisan, lots of wrangling over a number of years. But ultimately, you know, there became sort of, at least a more academic consensus that uh, the stimulus was really important. It should have been bigger, but even being undersized, it did a lot to stave off a worse recession. And it feels a little bit to me like we haven't learned all the lessons and we're still having arguments that are more ideological than uh, one would hope in this, in this period of crisis. But it does feel like we're building on some of those lessons and we are in a position where both parties are willing to be bolder than I think has ever been the case, um, at least certainly in the post-war era. Um, and I think that um, I think that is somewhat of a hopeful sign. I think um, I think these implementation challenges during a pandemic um, are real. So I'll, I'll end there. Uh, this is Sarah. Um, I just I to to make Sharon's point a slightly different way. The composition of people on this call today from lots of different points of the ideological spectrum talking about uh, you know, the right ways to support the economy through this crisis represents a consensus about a public sector role that hasn't existed, didn't exist into even in 2008 or was slow in coming and hasn't really existed in the last 20 years. That's a combination, as Sharon said, of some lessons learned and I think the unique aspects of uncertainty we have around this kind of crisis, but that's something to be celebrated and to build on. So this is Carl. I think that um, I share the same source of optimism as most people that the nature of the crisis has made people more willing to go big. I think that my concern is that uh, fear over uh, budget deficits will cause people to uh, pull back too soon and that a concern that only targeted relief is effective will cause us not to have as strong uh, stimulus as we could. Can I say that I'm not, I accept the fact that if status quo, that there would definitely be an increase in deficits and spending. 
I'm only suggesting that uh, maybe we've learned our lesson here that we should start paying for our service, for paying for government services uh, rather than simply adding to the adding to the deficit annually. And I think maybe coming out of this, there'll be a greater attention paid to making sure that we are putting the dollars target dollars on such things as public health, infrastructure, transportation, but let's pay for it while we're at it as opposed to passing it on to future generations. Uh, this is Tim Bardick. What I would add this kind of second what Carl said is that I, I, have, I have been optimistic that people have been willing to think bigger than I might have imagined, but I wonder if this is going to persist and I wish we had a structure where we had some automatic fiscal stabilizers that we had agreed on that would allow the response to get very big, as big as needed, and then phased it out as the economy recovers. Well, I think we'd be in a lot better shape. We could respond in a bigger way, and yet there'd be some reassurance that as the economy recovered that this would be phased out. And uh, we'd be much better off if we had those kind of formulas that targeted aid when it was needed and where it was needed. Thank you. Any other? Uh... Final thoughts. All right. Well, so let me uh, let me scoop this up. Uh, share just a couple insights uh, from uh, our ledge team about what's happening on the ground. Some of you may be getting this real time as well. Um, you'll remember that about 40 hours ago, Senator Schumer said we were on the two yard line. And for those of you missing football, it just reminds you how long the end of those games can go. Um, we are not yet uh, with agreement. Uh, a few senators, in particular Scott, Sass, and Graham, are actually objecting uh, on the unemployment insurance provisions based on the concern that it's creating a disincentive uh, to participate in the workforce. Um, I am assuming that uh, that gets bottled up somehow because Senator McConnell is pretty good at that. Senator Sanders is also expressing some um, reluctance to embrace the package, which creates a whole set of other possible dynamics, but um, yeah. Team still thinks it's going to work itself out, but not as quickly uh, as I think we were hoping. It also sounds like unanimous consent in the House is going to be um, miraculously hard to achieve, which for a $2 trillion expenditure on some level uh, doesn't feel inappropriate, but I'm sure many of you have heard that Governor Cuomo is uh, discouraging the New York delegation for supporting the bill. Um, there are a series of briefings going on now with the committee chairs trying to explain the bill to the House caucus. There are these horribly graceful emails going around to members of Congress from the speaker's office, leadership office saying, if you'd like to be removed from this list, please click here. So they're basically allowing members to unsubscribe from the briefings so that they don't find the email too burdensome. Um, our team thinks unanimous consent is going to be very hard to um, pull together. So I think the you know, general sense is this is going to get done. Um, not likely that it's going to be to the president's desk tonight. Um, so share that just unfolding reality, but the view then is that they will leave town and not come back pretty much for the you know remainder of March and April. And so that is a policy window for us to um, think about what's next. I think that uh, you know, CV4 um, we expect will be upon us when Congress comes back and that there's going to be a dynamic discussion through May that will result potentially in another big piece of legislation uh, late May, early June. And so I think as we at BPC think about what we could do collectively through these discussions. It's now a question about can we start to frame them in ways that are a little bit more precise around particular questions. I think the kind of you know, crowdsourcing, brainstorming of this process has been really dynamic and fun. And now the question is can we um, in targeted ways advance uh, some of these questions. Um, we also are keen on not trying to um, be the convener of record, and so we'd be delighted if other organizations want to pick up an issue. Um, we certainly are happy to share lists on who's called into these discussions, and so really eager to just think with those of you who are also running organizations and trying to figure out how to be collaborative and efficient, um, how we can do that together. Um, I think we're going to come up with some suggestions and bounce them off a couple folks, um, but um, so far, I believe that the rhythm of this is, uh, albeit imperfect, um, worthwhile. And so we're going to look for your feedback and see if we want to do something next week or the week after on a narrower set of questions. I will just end by saying that it does seem like it is implementation, the interactive uh, aspects of these different programs, 
and then the question about how we evaluate whether they're working and how we um, improve them that are going to be kind of dominant, at least in our mind going forward. So I thank you for joining us again and um, hope everyone has a uh, safe and uh, hopefully sunnier uh, tomorrow than today. Take care. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for your team too. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.